happening, everyone? We want to welcome you to our live stream this morning in lieu of everything that's been going on today. Uh, we, we've had major issues in the city of Texarkana, um, as you're probably well aware of this morning, that our water has been down, and it's down here at the church as well. And so we thought it in the best interest, myself and the leadership of the church, uh, to make the decision to not have services this morning uh, in light of these things. Uh, we didn't want to take any chances with that. And so we want to thank you for tuning in live this morning and making sure that you uh, paid attention online with Facebook and the other ways and methods that we reached out to you. We would ask you, as of right now, that we plan on having our service tonight, 6 p.m., as we were already planning to have our missions meal in the fellowship hall behind us at 6 p.m. And so unless you see a message on Facebook, and I will try to post around 3 p.m. to make sure to let you know that we are or are not having that service tonight, then please intend on being there this evening. And so um, I understand that there's boil orders and different things like that with the water in place, but our leadership will make sure that everything's done uh, at a maximum effort and that it's done uh, with excellence to make sure we take care of you guys if you come for that tonight. So we encourage you to plan to be here tonight for that. And if something happens, uh, we will get word out. And so please just pay attention to our online status to make sure you know what's going on. Let me give you a couple of other things this morning before I minister, because I do feel the Lord would have me to say something today uh, that I want to share with you. And uh, I won't be very long this morning. I'll be as brief as I'm able. Uh, but first off, uh, I want to address membership as well so you don't forget about this. But at the end of the month, we will be having a mandatory membership meeting with all current members. Again, that'll be in the fellowship hall uh, where we're going to be laying some things out. So please be a part of that. Deacon nomination form. It's this lime green. Uh, if you if you filled one of these out or if you're going to, make sure you're a voting member that you've been praying about what God would have us to do there with our advisory board and get those nominations back to me as soon as possible because at the end of March, I need all of them and we will close the nominations then. Uh, that way I can do what I need to do in April for interviews and uh, get the names out for those that are going to go through with the process. Also this morning, I don't want to be awkward about this, but since we aren't here for church, we would ask you that if you're coming tonight, uh, you can bring your tither offering just in case uh, you were going to do that this morning. Uh, we ask you, you can also go online to the status that we have there to give online if necessary or if you're able. But if you can't do it that way or you may not know how to do it that way or may not want to do it electronically, uh, you can bring that tonight. Make sure it's marked because we don't want to get that mixed up with the mission money tonight. And so make sure you have it marked accordingly, tithe. And if it's offering, make sure it's marked for where it's going to go and so it can go to the designated area. And so tonight, bring that with you if you intended on doing that as well. And again, on tonight, if you're just tuning in, we do intend on having services tonight. And so uh, it will be a missions meal service. We will be in the fellowship hall at 6 p.m. We intend again on having that service, but if for some reason we see we need to cancel, which we don't foresee that happening right now. Texarkana Water Utilities is saying that they've almost got everything done. They're expecting to be back by 11, 12, hopefully at the latest. So that would give us time to prepare for tonight. And so if that happens, um, then we will be right back on status to carry on with tonight. And so please be here again, intend on doing that tonight at 6 p.m. 3 p.m. on the church Facebook page, we will post and let you know one way or the other if we're going to continue to have that service tonight. Well, this morning, uh, I do want to address some things in Scripture very quickly. Uh, and it, I was telling those that are here with me that are filming right now how awkward it is to do this without music and without the normal presence of what we do. But, but we're going to do this and trust the Lord to do what he wants us to do this morning with the Word of God. Uh, but, but as I prayed this week, I had a sermon ready to go. And then as the coronavirus thing continued to become an issue in our nation... Um, our denominational leaders in the Assemblies of God, as well as other Pentecostal movement with the Church of God and, and others have made statements about this. Even the President of the United States has addressed the nation two times this week alone about this situation. And as I was already prepared to preach something this week, I felt the Lord quicken my spirit. And I felt the need yesterday to readdress something that I felt I needed to say this morning. And so I'm just going to follow the lead of the Holy Ghost, as God has told me to do so. And I'm going to read a familiar passage that I know that you've heard before. Uh, in fact, it becomes popular every time there's a tragedy in our nation. 
You'll see signs go up everywhere. You'll see uh, people begin to quote this verse. Uh, but I want to address some things that the Lord's laid upon my heart. It comes out of Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. And it says this, The Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer. Now, isn't that a good thing that God hears our prayer? It doesn't just go up into the air and fall down or hit the ceiling. And sometimes it may feel like that, friend, but it tells here that Solomon was heard by God. And so God listens when we pray. And he says, I've chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. He was talking in, regarding, or in regards to the temple that Solomon had built for worship in which David, his father, had given him the plans for. The temple was now complete and the Lord was telling him, I've heard your prayer and I'm going to honor this house. How many of you know that God still honors the house of God? I know we're the temple of God, but just as we're here this morning, or I'm here this morning with a few others, now we he does honor the house of the Lord. And so God's telling us this in this passage as we begin. Going into verse 13, it says, if I shut up heaven, again, this is God speaking, if I shut up heaven and there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, listen, it's the Lord saying this, if he commands these things to happen. Some say that God wouldn't bring those things. But it says here, if I'm the one that does this, or if I send pestilence among my people, here's verse 14 that everybody knows. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, notice he says my face, not my hand, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Verse 15, now my eyes shall be open and my ears attent or attentive unto the prayer that is made in this place. Again, the house of God. For I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually or forever. And for a few moments, I want to take a, a brief phrase out of this text and just share some thoughts with you that God has laid upon my heart, not just here for First Assembly of God, not just for Lighthouse Ministries in Texarkana, Texas, but, uh, but for whoever this goes out to, I want to try to bring some, some peace and some ease into the hearts and the minds of the people across this nation. And I want to call this morning, God speaking here, if my people, if my people. Well, friends, what has began as a joke on social media platforms, even news outlets, whether it was Fox, CNN, what began as a joke about an outbreak of a virus that was taking place in small numbers in other nations around the world has now spread to our country and has brought a moment of fear, a moment of trepidation to our nation today. And whatever store you go to, water is depleting, toilet paper is depleting, and you can't find it. Now food is the next item that has been going down as there's panic nationally about the outbreak of the coronavirus. There's national and worldwide panic now happening all over the place. And some might say it's, it's not real, but it is very real, friend, what is taking place. Um, in fact, doctor friends of mine that, that, yes, I do have doctor friends, they sent me messages that the CDC has given them as doctors that have told us what to do about this. And I want you to understand, we didn't cancel services today because of this. We're not afraid of sickness or afraid of a virus. It doesn't determine what we do. This morning was for water outage alone. But we do need to be cautious and careful about what we do with this and understand. Does God give grace and does he protect his people? Absolutely he protects his people. But he also gives us wisdom enough to know when we need to do things and when we don't need to do things. And so some say uh, this coronavirus outbreak is a political move and some say it's a scare tactic and some say it's fake. But we have to do our due diligence as the people of God and be the people that God has called us in moments like this. The President of the United States, as well as the leaders of the Assemblies of God, have asked today, get this, the President has asked that today be a national day of prayer across the country, across the entire nation. I want to honor that request, not just of our President, 
but as well as our overseer, our superintendent, Doug Clay, and Dr. Clonch at the North Texas District, our superintendent, who's asked that we honor that same request. And so I want to show you how this happens as they've asked us to have a national day of prayer. This is exactly what's taking place in Second Chronicles chapter 7. All of Israel is gathered around the temple, and, and they've been seeking the Lord, and the presence of God has fallen at that temple in such a way that they haven't ever experienced. They've heard of it going back to the days of Moses, but they've never experienced it themselves, and the presence of the Lord is upon them, and he's, he's there with them, and he begins to speak to Solomon and tell him, listen, my ear is open to your prayer. And that's the first thing I want to tell you today. In the moment of national outbreak and where fear is ruling the hearts of men and women, friends, we've been told in the Bible that we haven't received a spirit of fear. We've received a spirit of power, love, and sound mind. That's what Paul told Timothy. And so the child of God has no reason to worry. We have no reason to fear. There's no purpose or intention for Satan to be able to get to our mind and make us operate by what if something takes place when God has already told us everything he will do for the child of God. So friend, I want to begin all this by telling you this according to the text I read you a moment ago. God is in control. I said God is in control. Where we get this in this passage is in verse 13. Look at the term again where God says, if I shut up heaven and there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, now, I want you to get this. This may not be a popular thought concept, and it may not be something that we embrace all the time, but it's truth. God saying that there may be moments of time where I inflict something on the earth. And where most of us will try to figure out why he's doing it, all the self-righteous will say it's because of sin. The, the, the ones that aren't living for God will say it's because he's angry and he's not a loving God. But I'm not looking for the answer of why he's doing it. As much as I see here that if God is the one that chooses to send pestilence, then get this, friends, God is the one that can remove the pestilence as well. He's in control. And if he sends something like this, there's a reason for it. There is a reason. We don't have to know the reason. God doesn't owe us an explanation. But yet there is a reason. There's a purpose, according to Ecclesiastes, to everything under the sun. When God chooses righteousness, it's right. When he chooses uh, something of judgment, it's still right because it's God, he's good, and he knows perfectly what he's attempting to do. Can I remind you this morning that there's nothing going on in this present world that God doesn't know about? And there's certainly not anything in this world that may take place that God cannot handle. But look at the verse again. He says that, that even if he brought about, if God himself brought about what was going on, he goes on in the next verse and says, even if I shut up heaven and I, I, I bring the locust or if I send pestilence, he said, if my people who are called by my name he tells us, and what this means here for us, church, is, is that no matter what comes in this life, not just right now in a national moment of emergency or tragedy, but in any situation in our lives, it doesn't matter if it's even God sent into our lives, we can find grace in the hand of God if we come to him in this situation. But the matter is if we come to him. So what does the answer to this look like? Very quickly. Well, the Lord told Solomon if he was going to bring problems that there was a way to touch heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes me feel really good that even if God brought consequences of judgment upon the earth, that we could call on him and find grace. Can I tell you today, that this morning, that it is time again for the church to touch heaven. We've got to get to a place again where we know how to touch heaven. The church prior to us, they knew what it was like to pray through. Friends, we've gotten so busy today that we don't want to pray anymore. In fact, some may be very excited that we didn't even have a church gathering today so they could sit at the comfort of their home. And friend, this has got to change. This mentality has got to change. We're not just going to see our way through a tragic disease like this. We must seek heaven and believe that God is going to change the situation. The promise is that God is going to hear us, he's going to forgive us, and he's going to heal our land. But friends, you don't get answers from heaven until you diagnose the problem on earth. Let me say that again. You will not get answers from heaven until you diagnose the problem on earth. 
What do you mean by that, diagnosing the problem on earth? Well, it's very simple. God's not just going to take care of us and give us grace and send answers if we don't meet the conditions on the earth that are necessary to make sure those same repetitious issues don't exist again. It's very clear from the text that plagues of the nation of Israel was connected to the frustration that the Lord had with their departure from the word of God. Now, I know that some are going to hear that statement and they're going to say, wait a minute, Brother Josh, are you saying that the coronavirus outbreak is coming from the Lord? Friend, I can't tell you if it's coming from him or not, but we did, we did not just see in the passage that the Lord himself said, there may be times I shut off the rain. There may be times I send locusts to destroy the land. And there may be times that I send pestilence. And I can't tell you because God hasn't said to me, he doesn't owe me an answer on this. But what I do know is in any situation we face in this life, we've got to seek the face of God. And this is what I want to encourage this morning, that, that the answer is given to us here in the passage of what to do and how to approach this situation so we don't go about this with fear and worry and anxiety, but we face this the way that God wants us to face this. So the problem we face, honestly, no matter which way you want to look at it, good or bad, the, pr the problem that we're facing right now, and hear me as I say this, the problem we're facing right now is an attempt of the Lord himself to draw people to his presence. We saw it with 9-11. September 2001, where our World Trade Centers were hit in New York City, and for a time, people wanted to get to God. We saw it in 2004 with Hurricane Katrina. I was here as a youth pastor at that time, and I can remember going across the street every morning cooking breakfast for the refugees that were here. We saw panic as people didn't know what to do. Again, as we've went on, we've seen outbreaks of other diseases and things that have happened and hit our nation, hurricane after hurricane, earthquakes, tornadoes, all the things that have come at our country, and yet we still stand today, and I believe it's because of the church's call to their heavenly father. And again, today, I believe that's the answer. And so today I want to encourage you, don't try to figure this out. Don't try to ask God why he's doing it. I want you to know this morning, the issue is, is the human race. We've fallen from the glory of God. He's not angry. His anger has been taken out upon his son. It says he placed it upon Jesus on the cross, but now we don't need to be splitting hairs over the details, trying to decide who's right on what's taking place. We just need to get to the answer. What did God say the answer was? Well, number one in the passage, as we heard it a moment ago, it says, humble yourself. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Now, I want you to grasp something before I go into this teaching. God is talking about world problems in their day that would happen. Again, he would shut the rain off. He could send disease. He could send locusts to plague the land. So he's, he's addressing water, he's addressing food and substance, and he's addressing health. And God's saying, I could send those things, and he's not doing it just to the church. The world is being affected by it as well. And so we find here in this passage, as we're seeing this, that, that, that he, as he speaks, he's not speaking to the world, he's speaking to his people. In fact, it begins with that phrase, which is the title, if my people will do this. You know what that tells me today? That we, church, we, the children of God, are the answer to the world's problems. That if we would call on our Father and we would glorify Him through our mouths, through our lives, the actions in which we live, that it would lead people to Him, it would in turn bring Him glory, and that God would move in the problems that are here, whether He's allowed them, brought them, or is just overseeing them Himself. But it all begins with this first part, humility. Taught on this Wednesday night with meekness, the fruit of meekness about being humble and what it looks like. But I want to tell you this very quickly, and, and, and here's a definition of humility as the Lord gave it to me yesterday. Listen to this. Humility is the permission God needs from me and you to operate in our lives. Scripture tells us this, that God will not operate in the heart of a person that's prideful and, and has their own agenda or has something going on where they want to utilize God for their own benefit. So we've got to humble ourselves. 
More than anything else, this humility I'm talking about is, is not simply trying to give parts of ourselves to God. You want results with God, and if you want results with God, you can't give portions of yourself to him. You must give yourself to him entirely. In fact, Jesus didn't die in part. He didn't just give the right side of his body. He died entirely, totality, in mind, body, and spirit. He gave himself on the cross that we could obtain everything we needed from God. Humility is a constant and a continual theme throughout the Bible. James chapter 4 is one of the, the great discourses on humility, and listen to what it says in verses 6 through 10. But he, giving speaking of God, gives more grace, wherefore he saith, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he shall flee from you. Draw nigh unto God, and God will dry, draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and let your joy be turned to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. This is speaking of seeing answers from heaven in prayer. In fact, when you go on to read this in James chapter 5, as the thought continues over and he's speaking about Elijah, he says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Well, to get to the place of being fervent in prayer, we must humble ourselves to where our minds and our lifestyle are not set on things in this earth or controlled by the thought process of society. No matter what tragic moment may be going on around us, our eyes must be fixed on heaven, but we must humble ourselves to the will and the desire of God. It all connects to the text today. What James is saying is this. You want answers to serious prayers and issues, then be serious with God. This is a serious moment. People are scared, and we've got the only hope there is, and that's Jesus Christ. Yes, we're promised healing, but I don't want to deal with healing as much as I want to deal with Christ because he's the hope, not what he can do, but who he is. So friends, I encourage you today, get your agenda out of the way. Get rid of your excuses with God. This is not time to have excuses anymore in these last days. Reprioritize your life and let's get real with God. Let's get real with God. Again, let me repeat this. If you want answers to serious prayers and issues, then it is time that the church be serious with God. So what does the answer look like beyond humbling ourselves? Second thing he said was to pray and seek his face. And he means exactly what he says here. Pray and seek my face means to determine that God has the answer and that he is the only one that can change this. Friends, I believe this wholeheartedly, that Christ is the only answer for the world. Not the church, the world. He's the answer for everything in this life. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, Lord, it is by you that I live and breathe and have my very being. This is what we do. It's who we are. And notice the terminology here. And I know people will point this out, but I want to point it out now as well. Instead of saying pray and seek what he can do or his hand, it says pray and seek his face. That what this means, friend, is that we're not asking God to do something as much as we should be asking just to get close to the Lord. In moments like this, it's not an answer we should seek. It's the place the answer comes from that we should seek. And so he says, pray and seek my face. Try to get into my presence. Oh, pray until you feel the glory and the presence of God move upon you. That's the request here or the command that God has for me and you. And so we must pray and seek the face of the Lord. Well, Brother Josh, you don't understand how hard it is to find time to pray. Well, friends, tragedy has no time frames either. It's going to come whether you want it to or not. But if you believe Christ has the answer and that Christ is the answer, then you will carve out time to make sure that he's the priority of your life and you go there for the child of God that does this. And they call out to the Lord as he told Solomon, my ears will be open to them. And whose ears would I want open to be besides our heavenly father? But along with this, we don't pray when we don't pray then we're only looking at, we'll, we'll begin to find answers for ourselves and we'll decide that we can do it without the help of the Lord. But friends, God says to pray and seek his face. So it is safe to say that if we don't pray, 
listen to this, things will not change. If we do not pray, things will not change. And I'm not talking about your one month of intensity after a tragic moment. I'm not talking about just praying during this situation. Yes, we need to pray and ask God to move. I'm talking about seeking the face of God and getting to know him, him getting to know you, and you pray until you really begin to feel the burden that the Lord has for humanity. Pastor, does he really have a burden? Well, Jesus even said, take my yoke upon you. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So yes, there is a burden of the Lord Jesus Christ that comes upon our hearts, but it only comes through prayer. It comes through seeking his face, it comes from humbling ourselves, removing our agenda, getting in the presence of God and seeking him through prayer. Church, I cannot say this enough, but we must be people of prayer. Other thing he said was turn from our wicked ways. Now this is something the modern church doesn't like to discuss in this country. Well, I'm not a sinner. I should be able to do what I want to do. And maybe I'm not reading this right in the passage here, but does the scripture say that we, the church, need to turn from our wicked ways? Well, it certainly does. In fact, if you remember how the passage begins, it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and then turn from their wicked ways. You know, I feel often that the modern church focuses so much on the sins outside the church that they can't see their own sin. Jesus even said this himself, that we focus on the speck of sawdust in our brother's eye, but we won't pull the plank out of our own. It's time for the church to be broken again about its frailty. It's time for the church again to recognize the wickedness of the walk that we have. In fact, the Bible tells us that the heart of man is desperately wicked. That doesn't mean that we're wicked people if we've been saved, but it doesn't mean also that everything that's wicked has been delivered out of us. There are issues. In fact, if God is telling the church of that day in the Old Testament that there was wickedness going on, then friend, then today you better believe of all of the things we have available to us today through technology and money and all the resources that are around us that we have things ingrained in our lives as well that God's not very pleased with. But if the church will clean itself up, then it can be successful at cleaning up the mess around us. And then we can get people to God through the moments that are taking place just like this. But if the world's looking for hope and the hope they look at, which is supposed to be the church, looks, acts, and talks just like them, then what hope do they have? The cycle will just continue. Why is turning from wickedness so important? Well, friend, wickedness always has consequences. Wickedness always destroys Wickedness and sin always sets people apart from God. They're separated from him. And it's in moments like this that, 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 that can't turn the church towards God to search their heart. If we can't get to a place where we get to God in moments like this, where we say, Lord, examine me. Look at me and see if there's anything so that others can see you in this moment, then how's anyone else going to be able to get to God? Church, I want to tell you today in our nation, the church's voice has not been silenced. The church's voice has not went away. The church's voice has not been snubbed out by Washington, D.C. But hear me clearly when I say this. The church's voice has become a joke because we don't practice what we preach. That's what's happened to the voice of the church. People know it. They know where to get it. But when they see us, who is the church, not the building but the body. When we're not backing up what we say, then people don't want to be a part of what we're saying. So church, we must turn away from anything, not just sinful in our life. The Bible writers tell us to abstain from the very appearance of evil. If it could be construed as something, and some might say, well, pastor, that, that's crazy because that means that people could look at my life and, and, and I might have to stop some things that, that may not necessarily be bad, but it bothers other people. Yes, it's exactly what it means because Jesus said this. He said that if anyone causes someone else to stumble, that it's like they should put a millstone around their neck and walk off into the ocean and sink. So yes, we must be that careful. 
Yes, we must be that in tune with the voice of the Holy Spirit. And yes, we must search our lives and consider all of these things that could maybe be looked at the wrong way by the world just so we can get people to God. I want to say it to you like this. The only difference between Christians and unsaved people cannot be our church attendance. It cannot be determined that we're Christians just because we go to church. Is church important? It is vitally important to your walk with God and you continuing with the Lord. Yes, you need to be in a Bible-believing, preaching, Holy Ghost-filled church that is about the kingdom of God. But friend, hear me. The only thing different in your life or my life from the rest of the world cannot be that I go to church and they don't go to church. Yes, that's what it's become today, though. So we've got to get to a place because even that mindset and that mentality in itself about church attendance alone is wickedness. The Lord tells us if the church would turn from its wickedness, then he would begin to move and operate. So we've got a clean house. Peter even says those very words in the New Testament. Judgment begins in the house of God. In the house of God. The last thing the Lord said was what he would do. Everything that God does is conditional with me and you. What do you mean conditional? Well, the biggest English word that has ever been written is two letters, and it's in this passage of Scripture. If. If. That word if holds so much weight that it literally means that if, if, if you will do what you're supposed to do, God will in turn do what he promised. What did he promise us in this passage? He said, I will hear you, I will forgive you, and I will heal the land. This is exactly what the Lord's promise is. But again, that word if is planted at the very beginning of it. If the conditions are met. Think about this for a minute. If God would promise this to Solomon under the old covenant, then the promise is even greater under the new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ. God said if we would do these things, he would hear. If we would do what he's asked, he would forgive. If, he would, if we would do what the church is supposed to do, the land would be healed. And right now, especially right now, the land needs to be healed. Not just of a physical ailment, but it also needs to be healed mentally of the anxiety, the worry, and the stress that is being going on all around our nation. But I want to connect something for you before I move on from this. It seems that every condition has its own answer in the text. There's a progress here if you look at it. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, then you have the first answer that's given later on in the text. He says, humble yourself, I will hear from heaven. So get that and consider it for a moment. If we humble ourselves, the humility that we come before God with, the willingness to let God speak to us about who we are and where we are, that means God will hear us and he will turn his ears and his attention to what we're asking and he will listen to what we have to say if humility is how we operate. So humble themselves connects to hear from heaven. Pray and seek my face connects to I will forgive them. Consider that for a moment. Some might say, well, wait a minute. I think that means heal their land. No, it's got to be dealt with. Forgiveness has to be the the basis in which God operates. The sin's got to be removed before the blessing comes because God cannot bless when the sin is present. And so he says, pray and seek my face. This would be examination and moving before the Lord for him to deal with our hearts and our minds. And he says, if you'll do this, I will forgive you. Friends, we all still need forgiveness no matter how long we've been walking with God. So if we humble ourselves, he's going to hear us. If we pray and seek his face, he's going to forgive. Notice, it's not seek his hand to gain something. It's seek his face just to be before him. And if you do that, the mercy seat, the throne of God, he says, I'll forgive you. Then he says, if you'll turn from your wicked ways, it would connect with the last consequence or the last promise. I'll heal your land. So please understand me when I say this statement I'm about to say. Every sickness is not committed or or not connected to a failure in a person's life. If that was the case, we would all be laying in hospital beds every day of our lives. But we do see a connection here where God himself in the Bible is saying, if you'll turn from wickedness, I will heal the issues that are going on in your nation. 
I still believe the word of God in Proverbs where it says that righteousness exalts a nation. And it tells us if, as if a man builds the house, and if we build it with God, then it'll last. It'll be established. So we've got to turn from our wickedness. We've got to recognize as a church, as a nation, as a people of God, if you're saved, if you've truly been born again, that we've got to fall on the mercy of God. And if we'll do that, again, he said, if my people, not the world, if my people will do this, I will heal the land. You know what that tells me? How much weight and power does the church have today in this country? If through our own repentance, God can heal the nation. Through the repentance of the church, he could heal the nation. Keep in mind, the Lord didn't tell the worldly people to stop being worldly. He told the church to start acting like his people. So the choice is ours. It ends like this, 2 Chronicles 7, 15 and 16. Now my eyes will be open. My ears will be attentive unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Folks, I want to tell you today that God hears us. That's good news. God hears us when we pray. But it's one thing for God to hear what we're saying. It's another thing for him to listen to our plea, our petition, our supplication in heaven. And there's a way for that to happen. Now, my intention today would have been for us to come to these altars as we heard our president and our national denominational leaders request for us to do so and make this a national day of prayer. My intention was to have us come to the altars together as an entire body and begin to do what we're told here. Humble ourselves. Lord, is there anything in my life and my agenda? I want to put you first. Lord, is there anything as you examine me and I pray and seek your face just to get alone in your presence? Is there anything? Maybe as David said, try my reins, Lord. And then to turn from wickedness if there's things going on in our lives to get it right with God today. That was my intention. And then I was going to end with us all coming together, standing together after that seeking of the face of God. And then we would petition heaven as a body and as his people. That's what he told us. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven. I will forgive them. And I will heal their land. Friends, right now, we're in another tragic moment in our nation. You can say what you want to say or believe what you want to believe about it, but the facts are there. And I want to encourage you today as we can't gather together. Right now we can't. I want to encourage you. It's just a little bit after the 11 o'clock hour. Could you take until noon, since you would normally be at church with us, could you take until noon, close yourself into prayer, separate yourself, let your children go to their rooms to pray, but, but do this. Get alone with God. Seek the face of the Lord. Pray, and let's ask his presence to do what only he can do again. Let the church's finest hour be right now and not, not let it be because of humanitarian acts or, or aid or anything of that nature, but let it be our finest hour as we know how to petition heaven and we see God begin to move again. Again, our request as a national day of prayer has been instituted. Take until the noon hour. It's 40 minutes, folks. 40 minutes. Get alone with the Father. Let him break you. Let him speak to you. Let him deal with things in your life. And then the last 10, 15 minutes of that prayer begin to petition for heaven to move on the earth. As Jesus said, as, as your will is done in heaven, let it be done on the earth. And ask him for a move of God, for healing to take place, 
for people to come to a knowledge of him through this tragic moment. Friends, we thank you for your diligence in watching today. Please do what I've asked as far as prayer today. And again, we ask that you would be here tonight at 6. And we will let you know if we're not going to meet. We'll try around the 3 o'clock hour to let you know that. But again, let's petition heaven like we believe God to move. Because he promises he will if we'll do our part. Father, I ask you now, as this hasn't been a normal church service, hasn't been a normal ceremony or a normal situation, but I pray that you utilize it. I pray that men and women of God all across this nation and all across the world even would take their stance in the pulpit today and that we would call on heaven collectively and that you'd begin to move upon the church and as you move upon the church, Lord, then move upon the nation. Heal this great land that has propagated your name and been your voice and has spread your message throughout the world. I pray, God, you'd touch us again. Revive the church in a moment like this. Not out of fear or worry, but God, let us seek you because we know that we can find you and that you have an answer. But God, let us look for the presence more than the answer. Touch your people today. Draw us back to a place of humbleness. Draw us back to a place of being in your presence and the desire to be there, the first love, Lord. Let us be hungry for that again. And touch your people. Lord, if there's any that are sick that are watching this, I pray you would heal their bodies. Move in their bodies and do a miraculous work there as we believe you. Protect your people. And Lord, we ask that you stomp out this virus in this nation and remove all the fear, all the worry that the country may have in this matter at this moment. We thank you, God, for being you. We thank you for loving us, Lord. And let us be serious as we approach you and petition you in our lives. And we ask it today in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to thank you for tuning in today. And again, we will be back at 6 p.m. We'll let you know by 3 p.m. whether or not we're going to meet or not for sure. Uh, but we want to say thank you. God bless you. There's no reason to worry. Jesus said, take no thought of this life. That doesn't mean we don't prepare. But he said, what does worrying add any cubit to your stature? Or what is worrying going to change anything? Honestly, all it's going to change is your emotion and your mental stability. And so don't worry. God's got this in his hand. He's given us the answer. Now it's up to you, friend. Take the next 45 minutes. Go seek the face of God and spend some time with him. Thank you very much for tuning in today. God bless you and we love you, Lighthouse.